streaming now. Okay, welcome everybody to the first um, meeting of the Skills Economy and Growth Scrutiny Commission of this um, formal year. Um, my name is Polly Billington, I'm the Chair of the Commission um, and we will um, make sure that people can introduce themselves as they go around um, the meeting. But before um, we go any further, although I've declared myself Chair of the Commission, I am not strictly speaking Chair of the Commission until I'm elected. That's correct. And so, therefore it's your job, Tim, to make sure that we proceed through that election properly before we go further. Absolutely. So uh, there are just a few housekeeping things before we get to that. Um, so this meeting is being recorded and live streamed now. The press may be in attendance and the rights of the press and the public to record and film the meeting do apply. Please everyone keep your microphones on mute throughout as this will prevent audio feedback. And if you are still getting feedback, please turn off nearby devices. If someone forgets to switch off their microphone, they will be muted. All members and meeting participants should keep their cameras on. Please only unmute your microphones when you're required to make a presentation or ask or answer a question. If you'd like to speak, please raise your hand to get the chair's attention. And if you'll note, there is a chat function that should only be used to indicate that you wish to speak to raise points of order or to report tech problems you might be having, and I will assist you from that point. The chat function must not be used to have conversations with other participants or to enter personal or sensitive information. All chat is recorded as it's a formal meeting. If the meeting is going to take longer than two hours, we're required to take a five minute comfort break before resuming the meeting. And now on to the election of chair and vice chair. So may I ask the commission for nominations to the position of chair? I would like to propose Councillor Polly Billington. Okay. I would like to second that, please. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, are there any other nominations? Great. So, Councillor Billington is duly elected as Chair of the Skills, Economy and Growth Scrutiny Commission. And I'll hand over to you now, Councillor Billington. Thank you very much, Tim. Uh, we also need to elect our Vice Chair. Um, so, I would like to nominate Councillor Claire Potter as our Vice Chair. Uh, are there any other nominations for vice chair? That's great. Then we can welcome uh, Councillor Claire Potter as vice chair to the Skills Economy and Growth Commission. Um, next item on the agenda is apologies for absence. I will take this moment to remind people that we are effectively conducting these um, meetings as much as possible to support people who want to continue to fulfil their roles in democracy yet also want to be able to shield, shield and protect themselves in this uh, period of the pandemic. So although um, there are um, a majority of our members are here in the chamber, there are others who are joining us virtually to be able to take part in this discussion. Um, and in terms of apologies for absence, we have one, is that right? We have no uh, official apologies. We have no official apologies for absence. Okay, thank you. Um, and in terms of urgent items and order of business, I wanted to just ask Councillor Pallas if you wanted to use this opportunity, Councillor Pallas, to uh, raise the issue of the letter in relation to the community in, uh, infrastructure levy that uh, we received between the end of the last council year and the beginning of this one. Uh, Thank you, um, Councillor um, Billington, for, for raising this. Um, this has been a long-standing um, inquiry, um, which has taken a very long time for the committee to receive um, response. Um, it was about um, the criteria um, for um, the neighbourhood sill, which is going to be um, put forward as the Hackney Cultural Fund. Um, it was appreciated that we finally did get um, a letter after a very substantial period of time. However, um, th the letter really only skirted around um, the kind of substantive points and, and more detail is really um, needed, I feel, um, to, to answer um, some, of, some of the key issues surrounding the fund. Um, I have put together some questions and, and comments um, and I would greatly appreciate it if a letter could be sent from the committee um, to, to officers um, to, to clarify um, the, the points that have been put forward in the letter um, that, they, that they sent. Thank you. Thank you very much Councillor Pallas and um, I would recommend that we do go ahead to do that, M mostly from my from my perspective as as a chair who's previously acted as vice chair over the last couple of years, 
I don't think it's acceptable that scrutiny commissions are, are, are tra treated in this way when we ask reasonable questions about the decision making processes of allocating funds. Um, and for this to basically be sent across to us at the time when the fund itself goes live does not suggest an, um, and much appetite for transparency from the administration when it comes to these things. I would want to also make sure that these, my comments now are minuted and that they were also included in the letter so that the administration understands that we take our responsibility in terms of holding them to account and scrutinising the processes of allocating public funds very seriously. And we hope that they would also take our, pro our, our role as equally seriously and therefore reply to us in a timely manner so that we can actually scrutinise the decision-making processes that they're going through. Is that acceptable to the committee, to the commission? Right. Yes. Councillor Lufkin. Yeah, just to say I wholeheartedly agree with you, Chair. We've been waiting for this for a long time. It's Councillor Palace that's raised it ages ago. And I'm very pleased to see that you're taking it very seriously. Thanks very much. Thank you. Well, we'll we'll draft a letter accordingly, and those comments will be will be minuted for this evening, both from Councillor Palace, from myself, and from Councillor Lufkin. Thank you. Um, do we have any declarations of interest before we go ahead any further with them um, um, this evening's meeting? None from, from any of the councillors? None. No declarations of interest? Good. Okay. Well, we'll go to the confirmation of the terms of reference. Everybody should have seen those. Um, I think it's important, really, for us to just remind ourselves about these terms of reference. We looked at them quite carefully when we were designing the, and the proposed work plan that is outlined there. My, when I say we, I'm talking about specifically uh, myself and Councillor Potter, but other members who contributed to the shaping of that work plan um, and we're keen to make sure that we um, abide by that those terms of reference. I would also just make the, the brief observation that in very many other of the scrutiny commissions that the um, that are, uh, are part of the function of, uh, of um, accountability in the council, the functions of the council are much clearer sometimes than the ones for, for this one, because we're, what we're talking about quite often is how we shape, shape an economy well beyond the specific remit of, um, of, uh, of the council. And so therefore we need to be really clear about what we are asking of the administration in terms of their understanding of how much remit and how much power they have in this. Um, so are there any further comments on the terms of reference or are we happy to agree them as they are laid out? Agreed. Agreed. <laughs> Agreed. Great. Okay. Thank you. Um, so the next thing to look at is item six on the agenda, which is the work programme for the Commission 2020 to 2021. If you'd like to refer to that in your papers um, and have it in front of you. Um, uh, I'd just like to say, particularly give that, yeah, um, have grateful to Tim Up Upton, our um, support officer, and Councillor Potter for um, working on shaping this work programme, but they're not the only ones who've contributed to this. There are other members of the Commission who've also brought their thoughts to bear on what we should do. Um, uh, I, I suppose in some ways it could be a sort of narrative document to go alongside this to justify and explain our thinking about what we're trying to achieve here. But fundamentally, what we know is that we will be overseeing, understanding what the, well, overseeing um, and trying to understand better what the administration can do in relation to kickstarting the economy here in Hackney as the pandemic, as we try to uh, emerge out of the pandemic and see what the prospects are for pre-existing um, parts of our economy, such as the nighttime economy and our very strong small and medium sized business sector, as well as understanding the new opportunities that are arising out of a shift to a greener economy and how we make sure that we build on the, uh, the learning of how we involve the community in decisions around how we shape that economy. What we need from our workforce, not just the council workforce, but the wider working population within Hackney and what we need to do as um, a council to support them to adjust to a new kind of economy and seize the opportunities. We also wanted to specifically have some scrutiny of transport. We have that as part of our remit which is different from the approach perhaps from living in Hackney. Um, and we, so therefore we've set aside um, one whole session for looking at that. Um, the actions and measures that have been taking place over the last year or so, um, not only by the borough, but also by wider bodies such as TfL. And I think it's worthwhile just flagging at this point that there is 
um, particular appetite from the Children and Young People Scrutiny Commission to gather evidence from young people about um, transport in the borough, about how it connects, uh, how it improves their lives and how where they live, but also how it, it affects their connectivity to work and or whether it offers them opportunities for work themselves. So myself and Councillor Conway, as the chair of the Children and Young People uh, Scrutiny Commission, have been exploring how we might be able to gather evidence together that we could present to, uh, that could be presented to us at that meeting um, uh, that would be gathered from young people from across the borough. Um, I'd also like to point out at this point that we have done quite a lot of work already on things like the just transition and so forth in this commission but having had the the, the benefit of of our newly expanded commission is that we've got members who also have roles on other um of the uh, formal um committees of the council such as audit and corporate and we started to think as well about how to link up an overall strategy of scrutiny of the functions of the of the um Council when it comes to a greener hackney, so we can explore what the uh, we explore through corporate in terms of procurement, audit through what is the path and how you will spend the money, also co um, collaborating with living in hackney and of course with children and young people and maybe beyond, and that's partly being coordinated with myself and Councillor Sharman, Councillor Potter, and Councillor Gordon through overview and scrutiny. So we have some appetite to be able to do something at overview and scrutiny, which um, around the time of COP26 in November where we can start to, when we can set out a plan of wider scrutiny um, beyond this commission itself, where other elements of the of the scrutiny function will be able to ask questions about the about how the um, the administration is going ahead with this. That enables us as a commission to focus specifically on skills, economy and growth when it comes to a greener hackney, rather than sprawling out into large other parts of procurement and so forth, which could be better scrutinised by other parts of um, the scrutiny function. Um, and again, as you can see, some further focus on the support for businesses, future of high streets, health of micro businesses and the voluntary sector moving towards what will of course be election time uh, in uh, the early part of next year. Um, so that was our thinking behind that. Obviously, you can't do everything. And we wanted to be able to maintain a focus on what we thought our remit is and where we thought we could be most useful as a commission to scrutinise what we think, what we understand the um, administration is doing, but also to be a constructive scrutiny, uh, to perform a constructive scrutiny function to make proposals for what we think they should be doing if they're not doing it already. Um, are there any questions on this or um, can I open this up to further discussion from with the rest of the commission? Councillor Race. Chair, thank you um, for, for uh, running through the work program for the uh, coming year. I think it's a very strong uh, work program. I think there's lots for the committee to um, get its teeth into. I'm particularly looking forward to um, talking about future high streets and, um, and our strategy around that. So, um, as I say, it's a very strong program. I'm forward to participating in it. Thank you very much, Councillor Race. Any other? Uh, um, Councillor Sharman. Yeah, just to welcome the cooperative approach you're proposing with other parts of the administration. Because to me, if we can come up with all the good uh, policy proposals in the world, if you don't have either the resources or the management capability to achieve them, uh, and they don't find the requisite priority within the other council priorities, frankly, this becomes a talking shop. And I'm uh, therefore very much welcome our uh, thought. Uh, the thought of running it by and ensuring an audit uh, will certainly play its role. Its job is not to define policy, it is to make sure that the aspirations, policy aspirations, uh, can be funded on the one hand uh, and are balanced with, with other priorities appropriate as right decisions to be made. And secondly, that there is adequate support management process to put them into practice so i very much welcome your approach and look forward to working with you so we come out with some really practical fundable supportable propositions at the end of this year thank you very much councillor sharman i'm aware oh councillor potter i was just good going to as well um say that i very much appreciate that you've got the kind of green agenda running uh, running through and I can see you've done some further work in thinking on this as well. I think with corporate, we haven't had our first meeting yet, so we still need to 
explore how that's going to work. But certainly I'd just like to echo Councillor Sharman's comments that any means that we have through corporate, we'd like to support this agenda too. Great, thank you. I'm, I think it is important that we see this as something which we can collectively do across a range of functions and not simply see it in, in, in the remit of this. And we can therefore focus on the things that we really have responsibility for there's my point on the terms of reference. Do we have any contributions from um, any of the councillors who are joining us virtually? Councillor Smith, Councillor Palace. No, I think the work, the work programme is very exciting. Um, you know, green, clean and lean, uh, decarbonisation elements of it are really, really, uh, I think are important going forward. So yeah, highly endorse this plan. I think it's really exciting. Thank you very much. So I'm now going to um, move on to the meat of the meeting uh, this evening, which is our new member start here session. Um, with the thinking behind this was that we have an expanded commission with new members. Um, and also we have gone through a tremendous amount of change in our economy over the last year. And we need to basically have a little bit of a stock check um, on where we are, what we know about what has happened um, how different things are from the last time we were told how things are, um, and a little bit of an understanding about what kind of horizon scanning and future forecasting the council is already engaged in to understand what, what might be the opportunities, what might be the real stress points in uh, for our economy, what that means for our small and medium-sized businesses, what it means for our skills demand, what it means for our overall economy. Um, not only as Hackney, but also working in a in um, obviously one of the largest larger metropolises in the world. So, for, on that basis, it's lovely to see that um, Councillor Nicholson has has joined us. But I think pr primarily to this evening, we're taking evidence from senior officers um, so that they can give us a bit of a um, a. Uh, a, a roundup of where things are and how things have changed. Um, I think I'll hand over, broadly speaking, Stephen, I don't know how you want to play this. We've got 90 minutes, but my thinking was that we probably take, uh, I know that um, and not all of the officers can stay for the whole session. Um, how do you want to play it? Do you want to, the three of you to take to do the presentations and we'll take questions for Suzanne and then on to you guys. What's the best thing from your perspective? Chair, if it's, if it's okay with you and the Commission, what I was going to do was uh, do a, bit, a very brief scene setting. And within that, I wanted to make sure that the Commission were aware of um, what I'm doing, a wider reading. Um, uh, so I think going back to the earlier uh, item on Council Palace's letter, just so you're clear about what I'm responsible for, so you can make sure that I deliver for you and the Commission. Um, and then I'll probably hand over to Andrew uh, and then Suzanne or the way around um, on the specific areas that I know the Commission is interested in talking about tonight. Um, is that okay? Yes, that's fine. Just a reminder that since we only have Suzanne until eight, yeah. I'd like the presentations really, if we're starting out at 20 past, okay. if we can be if we can be clear of the of the presentations by 22, then we know we've got a, a good chunk of time to ask questions. Is that all right? Yeah, and I will race through mine um, and they should be available for members to pick out. Lovely, thank um, you. Great, so uh, thank you again for inviting me tonight. It's great to be here in person. I've had the uh, pleasure of working with um, the Commission before um, and both the virtual members and members here, with the exception of Councillor Spence. So nice to meet you, Councillor Spence. Um, I'm Stephen Haynes. I'm Strategic Director of Inclusive Economy, Corporate Policy and New Homes. It rolls off the tongue quite well, that one. Um, it's a new grouping of services that came into existence back in November last year um, during the, the height of the pandemic. Um, since I last spoke to the Commission, it's basically what I, what, what I did before plus regeneration um, uh, and area regen. So a really interesting group of services now. And what, what I want to do in five minutes max um, we just need to cover, have look the presentation up to I'm going to get it up now for you. Yeah, thank you. Just to cover uh, very briefly what the mission, vision of the group of services is um, and some of the headline work from the last six months or so. Um, and as I say, I'm hoping that gives the Commission a sense of what I do and how our remits can join up um, in terms of your work plan uh, moving forward. Then I'll hand over to Suzanne and Andrew on those specific areas you've asked to talk about tonight. Um, thanks, Tim. If we move on to the next slide, um, it's a structure chart. It's the classic structure chart. Um, I'm again going to into detail, but the services that come under my remit um, from left to right are employment, skills, and adult learning, 
um, business intelligence, elections and member services, um, policy and strategic delivery, area regeneration, and then regeneration, which is uh, the uh, house building, housing strategy, private sector housing. So that's what I'm responsible for. Um, next slide, then. thank you. Our mission, vision, well, it's, it, it's obviously been deeply affected by COVID and it's fundamentally about delivering a fair and inclusive recovery. So it's central to what you're talking about, uh, but also a more sustainable future for Hackney. Um, we're very clear that it's not a return to business as usual. We hear that a lot, but it's really important that we keep saying that. Um, and within that, uh, we're looking to deliver a genuinely uh, more inclusive local economy. Um, also tackle poverty, inequality, and climate change. So really quite big things there. Uh, going back to what you were saying earlier, Chair, about the role of citizens uh, in, in, in engagement involvement, we're really, really committed to this idea of people feeling like they have a, a stake in the bar and helping shape the decisions we make and the policies that we bring in place. So how are we doing that? Well, we're uh, building um, directly and also through partnership working, genuinely affordable homes. Um, and the ones I've highlighted here are the most relevant, I think, for this evening. We're supporting our businesses to recover and our high streets to recover uh, through championing SMEs and social enterprise. Uh, it's about town centre uh, shaping and place making with local people and businesses. It's supporting those who've lost work uh, to retrain and reskill through our adult learning offer, while we're also continuing to do what we do so well, I think, which is providing high quality apprenticeships and um, people, people jobs that are actually high quality. Um, again, referencing what you're saying about this huge remit. The other areas are, um, for you, I mean, in terms of what you could be looking at. Um, we're also going to be sourcing council services where possible, developing local supply chains that keep economic flow in localities. We want to use our land and buildings for public good, socially productive use, um, not just around uh, income generation. Um, and we're transforming our approach to poverty reduction uh, corporately through um, the work that Sonia Khan and her team are doing. So that's how we're delivering. Tim, next slide, thank you. Um, and again, it's just important to sort of bring the broader context in. Um, we want to support the wider organisation, that's um, the political leadership and the corporate leadership. And when we talk about the, the political leadership, we mean also the commissions that, that we work to as well. Really important, I keep saying that, um, because it's really central to what we're doing. Um, making sure that we have a long-term strategic vision for this fairer, safer, greener borough. Uh, we want to champion the communities that we serve, uh, and we want to provide citizens with the opportunity to share and express their concerns and aspirations with us. Um, Chair, I'm very conscious that I'm rushing through this, but I think it's important that you get onto the meeting and stuff. Uh, next slide, Tim. I won't go into this in any detail whatsoever, um, but I want to give you a flavour of what we've been doing over the last, last six months. Um, so Andrew's service has been uh, doing all that, which has been fundamentally about responding to the impacts of COVID, um, and he'll go into that in a sec working to deliver the Kickstart program. Something very close to Councillor Sharman's uh, interest is re-establishing the Great Fire Partnership, which I can talk to you about in detail at any point that you'd like to do that. Um, we've also brought adult learning within the corporate uh, offer, um, making that link between skills, learning, and employment, and establishing the, the STEM Commission, which as you know is a very important manifesto commitment. Suzanne's been doing huge amounts of work, fundamentally, most recently, on the Business Grants program, and She's too modest to say how much work she's been doing. It's been phenomenally hard and difficult, but Suzanne and her team have done an amazing job in doing that, and I'm sure she'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, again, stuff that you'll know about, all the workspace strategy, service resource planning, um, and our area region work, uh, physical, social, and economic. Next slide, Tim. Can you just skip one? Oops, sorry about that. In terms of regeneration work, making sure that we're delivering the program that was set out in 2018, despite COVID, Brexit, and cyber. And again, I know some of your work plan, you're looking to talk about regeneration more widely, and I'm, I'd be really, really happy to do that with you. I'm looking at how we work and what we do moving forward, and I'd really welcome the Commission's input into that. Um, we're doing some asset review work, which is basically taking stock of everything that we own, sites um, and land, and making sure that we're making the best, best decisions possible on the use of those sites and assets, being that housing supply, VCS, commercial, whatever it might be. Um, there's a wider capital program review happening. Again, how do we do capital program delivery? Um, a big piece there, uh, and some more specific sort of uh, corporate and organizational stuff. 
housing strategy, delivering the first Hackney Housing Association Compact, Merit Hackney's Housing Challenge, focusing really closely on the licensing scheme and inspections, and um, this priority housing critical area that we continue to develop as much as we can. Hackney supply strategy, which again links to the asset work and how we bring stuff on stream, and the beginning of the Hackney Housing Strategy, um, which needs renewal, um, and I'm sure the relevant commission will look at that, but again, big interdependencies with what you're looking at, thinking about here as well, I think. And the final slide, Tim, I think I've kept that to five minutes. Uh, corporately, um, you'll all be uh, aware of the work, I think, that Sonia and her team do, which is becoming increasingly important across the organisation, tackling um, policy and through transforming the approach to how we do that, embedding strategic priorities with the corporate plan, um, securing commitment from partners really around anti-racism, which is something that we are really kicking on with, um, uh, and embedding inclusive leadership into how we work as an organisation, um, moving away, uh, or rather embedding this idea, this idea of inclusiveness in all we do as a core principle in terms of delivery of our actions. And finally, um, last but absolutely no means least, um, Bruce Duval, who's responsible for member services, business intelligence, and now elections. Um, it's delivering what's delivered a COVID safe election. Um, so that's slightly uh, out of date because it's been done really effectively. We built the electoral register from scratch following cyber, which was no mean achievement. Um, and again, recovering stuff that has been impacted on by cyber. Uh, we're reviewing casework, which we need to talk to members about, of course, uh, and improvements to member remote working offer. Um, well, I hope you thought it's been improved anyway. Um, Chair, as a, again, that was a very quick um, uh, tour through what I'm doing, what I'm responsible for. Uh, any issues with any of that, you know who to come to. I think that's an important thing to say. So um, I'm going to now, unless there are any questions, but we can probably go straight into... So any questions or clarifications, anyone? <laughs> yes, please, no, Chair. Yes, go on. Councillor Smith. Um, yeah, thank you for that, Stephen. It's very comprehensive and there's a lot there, a hell of a lot there. Um, just on, on social infrastructure, you know, is as important as economic infrastructure um, to get, uh, you know, lower income people into better work. Um, what more do you think that we can do to support and strengthen um, those social resources like childcare, health, work support, and the mental health services? Um, to enable people to participate meaningfully in uh, society and the economy? That's the first question. Um, the second Gilbert, question, I was asking for questions and clarifications at this stage. If we want to open it a bit wider than like that, can we wait until we've heard from the others? Is that all right? Okay, yeah, that's fine, yeah. Yeah, okay. I, just wanted, I just wanted to see. There were a couple of acronyms there, ENPH I spotted, which Sorry. I didn't know what that was. Sorry, um, Chair. Yeah. Maybe if you could clarify the, 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 the Hackney Association Compact. I didn't quite understand that one. That's helpful, Councillor Smith. Go on. Um, EPNH is uh, an abbreviation, um, Economy Policy New Homes, which is trying to... Your Secretariat. ...the title um, somewhat. Sorry, Councillor uh, Smith, I didn't catch your second question. Oh, no, just the, the, uh, the Housing Association Compact, what, what, what that is. Um, I think it, it, I can. I think what would be best if I sent you something um, offline, Chair, because it's quite detailed um, and it's being worked for the moment. And I can share that with the rest of the Commission because it could take about five or ten minutes to respond on that. Yeah, that's fine. Thank you. Anything other in terms of questions or clarifications? Otherwise, we can we can move on to the other presentations. Thank you so much, Steve. That was really helpful. I'm, I'm sure people will come back with further questions, like Councillor Smith has done, once we've heard from the other two. Suzanne. Thank you, Chair. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Yeah. Yes. Um, I'm going to share my screen and flick through the, the presentation um, myself rather than Tim doing it. So as soon as I do that, I won't be able to see you all. Um, but if there is any issues, please just shout and let me know. Um, so I will do that now. Um, and as I do that, just to say thank you to the Chair and the Commission for having me back. I know I've been a few times before and it's great to be able to update you um so excuse me a second okay can people see that we can now yes would you make it larger though suzanne because it's quite small still that's great 
lovely okay, great so thank you um, so i know that the commission asked me to to come along and provide an update on the kind of covid 19 impact on the local economy um, and specifically looking at the different sectors um, of the economy and how it's impacted different sectors um, slightly differently um, and I should have also said I'm Suzanne Johnson, I'm Head of Area Regeneration for those who don't know me. Um, so I think I'm probably just a bit over five minutes but hopefully less than ten um, so I will um, quiz through the slides um, as quickly as I can while giving you the detail. Um, excuse me a second. I might need to It might need to be this way, unfortunately, because I don't think my down tab key is going to let me do the full screen. But hopefully you can see that OK. Yes, that's great. Thank you. Um, so in terms of a, an executive summary, um, clearly businesses in Hackney um, across London, across the UK, have experienced unprecedented challenges since the start of the pandemic. Um, locally and London wide data um, from businesses indicates that the creative sector Retail, leisure, and hospitality and industries in London have been hardest hit and will take the longest to recover. In Hackney, these industries make up almost 20% of our business community. Um, I think it's it's very important to say that it's quite difficult at the moment to know what the long-term structural impact of some of this is. And the reason for that is that we know that our, we, are, we, the council and government, have been supporting businesses with business rates relief business grants and the furlough scheme and a lot of businesses are still receiving that support now and as we move forward into the coming months that's when that support will really start to kind of peter out and um, hopefully things will go back to slightly more normal um, trading albeit it won't be fully normal so i think long-term structural impact is still something that a lot of people um, most people don't really know and um, but what i'll provide is just a bit of an analysis on where things are at the moment um, and re relate that to our economy. <coughs> we know about that. Um, in terms of our businesses in Hackney, um, so we've just got over two, 22,000 businesses, um, and you can see that the vast majority of those are micro businesses with zero to nine employees. Um, the next lowest rundown is the small businesses and medium and large businesses, so that's with over 50 employees, um, makes up kind of much less um, of our economy. So we are very much um, a kind of micro and small business focused economy with certainly some larger businesses and employers that you can see where the focus is there. In terms of our numbers of high street businesses, um, our latest estimate is it's around 3,000 retail, leisure and hospitality units um, in terms of high street businesses. Um, and that's based on some recent business rate records. Um, in terms of our key sectors in the borough, uh, and I'm sure most of you know a lot of this already, but hopefully it's useful a useful reminder. Um, those highlighted in grey are, are our kind of key sectors in the borough. So you can see construction is quite clearly high, retail high is very high, accommodation services, arts, recreation, culture um, sectors and services um, also very high. And then uh, in terms of the other types of sectors that are high in Hackney, with, in terms of the business count, it's information and communication, property, professional, scientific and technical and kind of business administration and support. Obviously the council making up quite a quite a large kind of proportion of that, I'm sure, in the hospital, Homerton Hospital. And then we've obviously got a kind of big cluster of professional IT businesses in Shoreditch and Hoxton primarily, but not exclusively, that make up a lot of those kind of more professional um, and, and information and technology sectors. Um, I've just pulled some information, I won't read this all out, um, but there's an awful lot of reports, as you might imagine, out at the moment um, from GLA um, and others who are looking at kind of, kind of projections um, and what's happened and what we know um, in the kind of in the medium term. Um, so in terms of our kind of main sectors in London, financial services, professional and technical information and communications, those have been hit less severely by the lockdown restrictions. Um, because of the fact that people are able to work from home in those sectors. We know that people are using public transport much less, working from home, and the key knock-on impact there is on the retail, hospitality and leisure sectors, and in central London and the city in particular. So for us, that's Shoreditch primarily, probably kind of moving into Hoxton a little bit there. 
Um, we know there's been a very negative shock in terms of the number of tourists and international students in the capital. And again, that knock on is really focused on retail, hospitality, cultural and leisure se sectors. Um, and that's kind of covered in this slide, really. Um, all sectors should see a recovery. This is quoted from the GLA economics report that I've lifted this from. Um, though accommodation, food services, arts, entertainment and recreation will, will continue to be the worst hit um, as they are most most likely to be affected by social distancing and all the things that I've, I've mentioned, you know, people using public transport less um, and less tourists, international students. Um, a further report from the GLA um, said continues to talk about the retail sector in particular um, and demand for kind of comparison retail stores, um, which is where you would buy clothes, electronic items, etc, etc, i.e. non-food items, um, is likely to continue to fall. Online shopping will continue to grow. I know that's not a surprise um, to, for anyone to hear that, um, but that's that we know that. Um, and we knew that the um, kind of retail sector was already shifting online and we know that the pandemic has effectively just accelerated um, that online shopping so what we do need to think about is our town centres in the borough um, and what we can do to support those town centres um, as we move into this continued shift um, to online retail. Um, so in terms of the impact on the Hackney business sectors, again, I won't go through everything here, but I've tried to kind of provide some information on their kind of some of our key sectors in the borough. Um, so we know that shops, bars and restaurants um, have all reopened, albeit with social distancing in place. Um, they're, they're reporting lower footfall to these businesses since reopening, um, which again, probably not a surprise. Um, and we also know that they're experiencing some difficulties, these types of sectors in recruiting staff because while they've been closed, many employees have moved on to different roles, left the country, um, and there's less students in London now. Um, so that's a, a big consideration at the moment is employment into these sectors. We know that many operators are in debt, um, unfortunately, because they've used a lot of their reserves and grants. Um, so again, they're all very keen, obviously, to start making money um, and generating an income. Um, and we know that also, in terms of the retail sector, some areas in the borough are suffering worse than others. For example, Shoreditch is suffering really from a lack of footfall of office workers, tourists, whereas other town centres in the borough, um, which have got much more of a kind of resident based population, um, we know are actually um, performing better um, anecdotally. There's more people there, there's more, more shopping happening there. Um, so that's a bit of an insight into what's happening with the retail sector. Oops, sorry. Uh, in terms of the leisure, creative and cultural sectors, um, what we know um, in Hackney is that a lot of our Hackney venues had very mixed income streams prior to COVID, um, which is quite typical of cultural sectors. Um, so mix of incomes from kind of workspace, venue hire, bars, etc. So this has made these industries um, much more vulnerable to the impact of the pandemic. What we do know is that a lot of Hackney um, cultural and arts venues have really done well from the government's cultural recovery fund. So we, we have a list of all the businesses that have received um, kind of support funding from this, and it's to the value of over 18 million, plus they've received grants, um, furlough scheme, etc. So a lot has been done to bolster these industries um, during during COVID. But the big concern now is you know them reopening and being able to generate the same income that they were doing. Um, which is going to be difficult. Um, some organisations um, are operating at a reduced capacity, um, as you would definitely imagine they should be and, and will be. Um, and then some are also not opening now. We know that some venues are kind of keeping closed until the autumn, where they could open at full capacity. Um, so that's a bit of a picture um, of the um, that sector. Um, and then our workspace sector, our shared workspaces, we, we've got about 125 and workspace providers in Hackney who weren't eligible for the main government grant program because they are they don't pay business rates a lot of these types of businesses and their tenants but we've supported them through our discretionary grant scheme and um, they were a big beneficiary of our discretionary grant scheme and anecdotally again we're hearing actually that the demand is still quite high and um, for our workspaces in the borough and um, it decreased during Covid and um, the kind of 
lockdown um, period of COVID, but actually we've been reporting, hear, hearing reports that their workspaces are doing okay and that people are starting return, to return to these shared workspaces. Um, I won't be much longer now, just a few more slides. These are just some figures um, of the grant that we've paid out um, over the last year. So the first kind of grant programme last spring and summer for business rate holders, we paid out 63 million. We're also now paying out, currently still paying out the kind of second tranche of the grants, um, which are called local restriction support grants and restart grants. And um, we paid over 44 million of those to date, and that's ongoing until the 31st of July. Um, and we've kind of processed an excess of 50 million business rates relief. Um, our discretionary grant programme has again been in two tranches. So last spring and summer, we gave out 3.4 million to 649 businesses. And then we're currently running an additional restrictions grant programme for the most recent period, the winter lockdown. And to date, we've given out over 5.6 million to around about 1,300 businesses. And that's still ongoing now. Um, and in terms of kind of the support that we've um, kind of tailored in Hackney to support businesses during this time, as well as the grants, we've got a kind of Love Hackney Shop Local campaign, which is really to promote our local businesses, get them online and encourage people to shop there either in person or virtually. Um, we've had kind of reopening advice for businesses running regularly through business forums to make sure they are COVID safe and COVID secure. Our property team have provided direct support for our own commercial tenants um, and council buildings. We've released some specific guidance um, for hospitality businesses to enable them to put tables and chairs outside more easily. We've supported our market traders um, and not charged license holders for periods when, they, when they've not been able to trade. Um, so we've done a lot, our markets team have done a lot with, with those traders. Um, and we've had a new website launched for the Hackney Business Network, which we launched earlier this year, just fo really focused on providing as much COVID kind of guidance, advice and signposting that we can. Um, and then last slide, um, in terms of the future strategy and our support for sectors and businesses, once we finish, paying out the grants programme, um, a real continued focus on our kind of area regeneration approach, which is very much bespoke programmes, <coughs> projects, support for our businesses, our town centres, very much based on their profile and what we know that the stakeholders in those areas are telling us. Um, so not a one size fits all approach. It's very much taking a specific and bespoke approach to each of our town centres. That's ongoing at the moment and that will continue to, to, to kind of roll out. Um, we'll obviously continue to operate the Hackney Business Network um, <coughs> support and advice. Um, we, um, we're going to launch a promotional campaign this summer um, focused on reopening um, with a big focus on our town centres and our cultural and creative um, and arts businesses. We're developing a borough-wide economic development and recovery plan um, which will really focus on our future approach to town centres pull a lot of the data that I mentioned because there's so much data and research being done as we speak on this. It's a very much shifting and emerging picture but we want to capture as much as we can and have a real, really good plan for what we are doing in Hackney. Um, we're also developing an economic development function which will sit within the area regen service. So some recruitment will happen later this year to bring in more economic development kind of officer um, support and roles um, for the council. Um, and um, we're going to focus um, on a further business grants programme because we are going to get a bit more discretionary grant funding from government very soon and we'll be able to spend that up to March 2022. So that will be about £3.6 million additionally that we'll receive um, in the next month or so that we will focus um, on business support, town centres, etc. And that is Thank you very much, Suzanne. I'm highly aware that, we're, that your time is constrained, so I'd really like to be able to open up questions to you now so that we can get the most out of your contribution that you've made so far, and then we can come back to Andrew after eight o'clock. So I'd like to um, ask the Commission members to raise their hands if they've got specific questions to ask Suzanne. Um, and uh, we've got about 15 minutes, so if everybody wants to get their hand in, Put your thing on mute. Um, no. I see, and you're struggling. It's quite a serious matter. That is a serious matter. 
and we, you can't get it. Um, you probably need some corded headphones rather than AirPods. Oh, how frustrating. Um, can we see if there's a better place for Councillor Sharman to be in the room where he might be able to this see a better? This is here. I could swap with you if you wish. Because you can hear perfect here. Perfect. I think just getting Councillor Sharman pro closer to a microphone will be better. Yeah, if you wouldn't mind swapping with, with um, that would be really helpful. I'll address this offline before the next meeting yeah. as well to see if we can't come up with something more permanent. Okay, um, hands up are either virtually or in real, in real time. Right, so I'm going to take Councillor Stops. Councillor Rayson and Councillor Lufkin. Yeah, um, well. Sorry? We've got Councillor Smith. And Councillor well. Smith online. So we've got four questions. For the in order for Suzanne to be able to reply to them fairly, I'm going to take the questions and keep them tight and then give her opportunity to respond. But if anybody's unsatisfied in any way <laughs> with the answer, then obviously I'll give you an opportunity to come back. So in that order, I think it was Councillor Stops, Councillor Race, Councillor Lufkin and Councillor Smith. Um, thank you um, very much for that presentation. There was a lot in it. Um, just what, one question, really, um, first, and then a comment. Um, the question is about, um, you know, whether you have any sense that people have left the borough. Um, I didn't see a sort of population estimate or what have you as to whether all these uh, 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 folks have, have left and gone on living in, in, I don't know, some part of the countryside or returned to their home countries, and whether that will have an impact on, on the borough. And the second question is a bit, is comment is a bit, question is a bit longer. Um, you, you had on your, your presentation about the area, regeneration areas, and Dalston, Hackney Central and Wick, of course, are there, and the, I think the word focus went with them, but we've got a lot of other um, centres you know we've got the um of course uh, stoke newington stanford hill victoria park hoxton um I, I just wonder what you sort of what the team sort of thinks about those other areas are they is it just too much to get involved in those or or, or are there smaller efforts made to to think about the regeneration of those areas that's very helpful councillor stops councillor race uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I think my question, I have a couple of questions, but I'm going to concentrate on um, just the um, the number of units that are used. Um, the estimate seems to be around 3,000. I wondered what, whether there was an estimate of how many uh, vacant units uh, there were in Hackney, whether that's gone up and whether the, we, whether the council expects those to go up over the next um, couple of years. And I think kind of connected to that, um, we obviously, there's a lot of insight in terms of moving away from um, shopping in shopping centres and town centres. And so I noted at the end there's a review into what the future of town centres looks like. I assume that will be within the context of COVID and, um, and how um, the behaviours of um, consumers have changed, accelerated change over the last um, year or so. And I suppose the question is, Really, what does what does the future for our town centres hold? That might be slightly uh, jumping the gun on the um, on the question, but um, the question. But, but I'd like to know whether that's the that's the direction travel of that review that we're, that um, that is planned. Thank you. Be, we'd look forward to coming and hearing more about inviting you back when we're doing our our stuff on the high streets later in the year. Now we've approved our work plan, Councillor Lufkin. Thanks, Chair. My question follows on from Councillor Racy, really. Um, we seem to have, um, with the decrease in footfall, the, the, the area that would seem to be most affected would be Shoreditch. Um, are we planning anything special there, or, or what's, what's the long-term plan for Shoreditch? Because that would seem to be the one that would be most affected by a decrease in footfall in, the city, in, in, in cities, as the, um, the others seem to be more local town centres, but Shoreditch tends to attract you know, thousands of people from outside of, outside of Hackney every weekend and the economics of Shoreditch and running bars or running hospitality businesses there may just no longer work and what, if anything, should we or could we do about that? Councillor Smith. 
Thank you, Chair. Um, in your presentation, uh, thank you, Suzanne, for that. Um, you mentioned that we're working to construct an economic strategy for the borough um, through tailored interventions. Could you just mention what some of those tailored interventions might be, if that's possible? Just a couple of examples. And then just on the broader point about you know high street rents, and I know it's slightly out of our control, but is there a way that we can think about getting the balance between the small medium enterprises like the baker, the pottery studio, the sewing room, the maker space, and the bigger retail chains that basically help to drive up rents? Because rents are really prohibitive, especially now after COVID when everyone's trying to you know survive so i just wanted to sort of just touch on that kind of rent situation and and, and, the, and the fact that high street rents are prohibitive of, prohibitive that's the word thank you thanks very much councillors suzanne that's a lot for you to respond to but i'm i'm confident you'll be able to come back yeah thank you very much yeah no i've taken down all the questions very good questions um i'm definitely happy to come back at a future date and talk talk more about high streets and town centres and um, so i'll just run through uh, in the order that they were asked um, so in terms of kind of people leaving the borough um, i probably can't answer that but we could certainly provide some supplementary um kind of info post scrutiny on 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 data on that um i, I haven't kind of received any data for that this evening in terms of businesses leaving the borough this is anecdotal but i actually I mentioned we've done a few rounds of our additional restrictions grants and actually I just we're just about to kind of put, put another kind of payment run through for businesses that we've already paid and I mentioned there's over 1,300 and we've emailed all those businesses to say if you've left the borough you must let us know because we can no longer pay you um, and I think out of 1,300 businesses I think I've only got about seven responses that have left the borough so in terms of people I'll, we can follow up follow up outside of the meeting in terms of businesses i think it's i think it's good news i don't think we've had a lot of businesses leaving the borough and the reason for that is is i think for, from a lot of the things that i went through in my presentation grants furlough scheme support that we we've given in hackney and um, to really encourage businesses to remain home firm and stay in the borough and i think it's very important that we now and I'll probably answer this further down the line um, and some of the other questions is, is really make sure that those businesses do thrive and they are able to stay in Hackney and keep employing people in Hackney. Can, um, I, just, so can, I, just, can I just ask a question though on that, Suzanne? The grants that we're giving are grants from the government. Yes. The grants are not actually designed to keep any business in any particular place, are they? And people could well, um, you know, can we actually keep, take credit for retaining the businesses in the borough when actually what we've been doing is allocating national government money to our local businesses. Yeah, I think it's probably, you're, you're absolutely right, Chair. I mean, the, the grants are to allow businesses to stay in, in business. Um, I mean, but often if obviously a business has got premises and has got a long history in Hackney and they've always, always been in Hackney, then you know the fact that we've been able to get a grant to them quickly and they've been allowed to keep their business open um, is, is, and, and running um, in some form is, is a positive thing. I think the other work that we've been doing through the other support interventions and, and measures that I mentioned um, and really trying to reach out to businesses, engage with them through the Hackney Business Network, I think is a softer side of things. But um, you know, I do believe that that's that's been a, a source of support for for a great many businesses, um, and I can't guarantee that that will keep them in the borough, because um, that's quite a difficult thing to guarantee. But I would, you know, I, I, I've heard very positive feedback from some businesses around the support that we've given um, grants, and obviously the other the other things that we've been doing as well, and really trying to champion champion our businesses. Um, I hope that I hope that's helpful. I will I will move down my list of questions. Um, so the next question um, was it was around the kind of area area regeneration kind of focus areas, um, and I listed a few um, on the on the slides, um, and that's certainly not all of them. So the remit of area region is really to focus on all of our town centres in the borough. So that's all of our kind of major and district and local town centres. Um, and in terms of how the service is structured, um, we have four area regeneration managers and they cover every part of the borough um, and usually with a focus on the town centres and their areas um, but the remit is very wide um, so 
in terms of the kind of priority areas in the inclusive economy strategy, we've tended to focus um, on our town centres, um, but there is scope to flex and change that. And the, the, the remit of the service is to respond um, to kind of inquiries that we may get for, from any <coughs> um, within that remit of kind of improvement, listening to stakeholders, place shaping, and trying to do the best we can for our places and our businesses. Um, so I hope that answers that question. And I should mention as well, we work very closely with our planning service um, and our strategic planning service. So in areas such as Stamford Hill, which was mentioned, the planning service is working um, up an area action plan for Stamford Hill. Um, and my service area is very involved and works very closely with strategic planning on documents like that, which will have a long term positive impact on you know, some of these areas that will, will receive this dedicated planning guidance. So I hope that answers that question. Um, I'll keep going and then if anybody wants to interrupt or has anything to add or anything else to ask at the end, I can I can stay around a little after eight. That's absolutely fine to, to make sure that I answer everything. Um, in terms of the number of vacant units, that's something that I'll, I'll definitely need to provide um, in terms of supplementary um, response to scrutiny. In the, at the moment, we're, we're in the process of signing up to a, a kind of Mayor of London's data store. Um, so the Mayor of London issues um, kind of vacancy rates for um, all the high streets in London, um, I think on an annual or kind of once every two year basis. As a result of COVID, the, the Mayor of London is, is kind of revamping their kind of offer of data um, that all councils and others can tap into. And we're in the process of kind of signing up to that to make sure that we have really good data um, and up-to-date data on high streets. Um, so if I can provide a kind of written response in terms of our vacancy rates, um, I, I, I will be able to do that following the meeting um, and happy to do that. I would say that the vacancy rates in Hackney in pre-COVID certainly were, were, were fairly low. Um, so I think they were about kind of seven to 8% um, generally in most of our town centres. Um, with slight variations and then national wide, nationwide the vacancy rate is kind of often 15% plus and um, so our vacancy rate in Hackney has always been quite low um, and I will certainly provide an update on the vacancy rate now. Um, anecdotally I don't think it's thankfully got much worse um, but I will confirm that. Um, Hope that helps. Um, so move away from shopping. Yep so the future of town centres. I mean I think the future of town centres is something that has been discussed for a long time before COVID and it's because of the reason that I mentioned um, it's the shift to online retail which has kind of been happening for a long time now and COVID certainly will have accelerated it and what we were finding generally in London um, and probably outside of London as well is that there was a move more to kind of experience retail so effectively things that you literally have to take yourself to to experience so restaurants and um, bars um, a lot of kind of beauty and leisure services, um, hairdressers, nail bars, etc., um, and other kind of leisure pursuits. Um, and I think that's kind of true of Hackney's, a lot of Hackney's high streets anyway. I don't think we have a huge convenience, fo sorry, a comparison focus um, in a lot of our high streets. Um, and in terms of what I would see happening in, in the high streets in the future in Hackney, I think it will come back to this quite bespoke approach that we are taking with our town centres. So making sure that we, we don't kind of assume the same um, kind of solution is going to work for all of them. Um, and the role of the area region managers is to really understand their places and make sure that we're speaking to local stakeholders, taking advantage of local opportunities and putting the right kind of uses in our town centres. So that's a fairly big question and I don't kind of have a definite answer, but that's basically the role of the area region function is to make sure that we are responding, we are nimble, and we can take advantage of changes, but we're also putting the right things in our town centres and working closely with our planning service. Um, and that might be something that I kind of come back to the town centre um, meeting of, of the commission and talk a bit more about, um, because I could talk a lot at the moment about what we're doing in Dalston and how that's different from what we're doing in Hackney Central. But I think that's probably such a big item. It's probably probably one for another meeting. Um, but rest assured, that's, that's what we are doing and, and really thinking carefully about the future of all these places. Um, and then I think second last question was on Shoreditch plans. And yet Shoreditch has suffered um, a lot in um, lack of footfall, very few office workers, 
um, and less tourists and we've really seen that change and that's kind of quite different from the rest of the borough. In terms of what we're doing for Shoreditch, we have a Shoreditch Area Action Plan, so that comes back to our kind of close working relationship with strategic planning. So we are working on a draft action plan for Shoreditch with planning at the moment, um, and I'm not quite sure when that will be out for consultation, but it's certainly been worked on behind the scenes at the moment. We've recently commissioned some research um, by an economic development consultancy um, called PRD, to, to talk to businesses in Shoreditch and find out what their plans are. And again, that could be something that I come back and talk a bit more about with a bit of an area focus um, on our town centres. Um, and then the other thing to mention on Shoreditch is that the, because Shoreditch is part of London's central activity zone, effectively the kind of middle bit of, of, of London where you've got the West End um, and kind of Westminster and kind of Kensington, Chelsea and other other central London boroughs, there's an awful lot of discussion at the moment between you know the City of London, the GLA, and those boroughs that are also within the central activity zone about what our future plans are. I mean, there has been discussions around, you know, well, we need all this office space and can it be converted to retail, sorry, residential, not retail, residential. And I think it's probably to uh, kind of mentioned at the start of my presentation, I mean, that's a real big structural shift in London. And I think we're too early to say, but I'm involved in all those discussions and that's a big part of our work at the moment is something that we're considering um, in the Shoreditch Area Action Plan um, in terms of what we do about, you know, what we think may happen. Um, and it's very difficult because people are still returning to work and we expect more people to return to office work, office spaces by the end of the year. Um, and I think we'll have a better idea then. Um, but there's certainly, for example, some research happening at the moment with big employers in the central activity zone to find out how many what proportion of their staff they're planning to send back to the office so there's all sorts of research kind of happening um, on that at the moment and i'm happy to come back and talk more about that as well uh, and then finally i think um, i'm happy to take more kind of clarifications or questions after um, in terms of kind of tailored interventions um, I mean, I think the town centre focus is effectively a tailored approach um, and that's something that you know, we could talk a lot more on. I could, I could share a lot more information on that um, in terms of what we're doing with our individual town centres at the moment and I'm happy to do that at a later date. Um, I think I'd very much like to um, kind of run some very bespoke business support programmes for some of these sectors in Hackney. Um, so cultural sector, retail sector, um, hospitality. Um, I mentioned this 3.6 million um, additional discretionary funding that we're going to get to spend by the end of March. Um, and I see that as a kind of real big opportunity to focus on some sector specific business support in Hackney. Um, so that's one of the tailored interventions that, that, that we're kind of working on in the background just now. Um, and then I think the final kind of part of that question was around rent levels. This is always really difficult. I mean, where we don't own buildings ourselves, um, it, it is very difficult to kind of manage those rents. I think the best way to do it is through that kind of bespoke area-based town centre approach where we actually get to know the landlords um, and work closely with landlords um, and make sure that we kind of set expectations about what we expect. I mean, it's very difficult because we can't, you know, um, kind of <coughs> rent levels for them but what we can do is encourage things to kind of happen and um, so we were very um, clear with the for example the owners of what is now the Hackney Tap and um, that was formerly a betting office and um, that, that we didn't feel that another betting office was the ideal use for such a flagship building in Hackney Central um, and I mean that's less so about the rent level but I'm using that to illustrate the kind of work that we do with landlords when buildings and, and sites come up for rent. Um, and then the other thing we can do is obviously purchase sites that are vacant. Um, so we certainly have done that as a council um, and that helps kind of make, make our portfolio larger um, and gives us more control over rent levels. Um, and also where we're, where we're, we're the developer, where the council is developing or working in development kind of partnership with, with another developer. Um, we can also control that and through our planning policies we also have a lot of control over um, kind of affordable workspace um, and the rent, le rent levels that are charged for those so there's a whole different kind of range of things we can throw at that one albeit we cannot control all the rent levels that's that's just something that is out of our reach unfortunately but there's a lot we can do to try and temper those 
as best we can. I think I've answered them all, but please let me Thank know. you very much, Suzanne. That's great. I mean, I would make one observation that may co we'll come back in our sort of recommendations later on in the year, but it's worth flagging now that in terms of this issue around regenerating our town centres, uh, facing the challenges of uh, a retail collapse, issues around residents, you know, uh, creating residential um, units and so forth. Um, I was struck by the absence, and maybe it's because you're presenting to us rather than to living in Hackney, but the issue of, or the uh, an absence of any sort of observation around things like the 15-minute neighbourhood, mm -hmm. where we know we've actually got some natural 15-minute neighbourhoods where people are, where those, like you say, those places are thriving because people are working from home, um, and other parts of the borough are not experiencing that because they have been reliant on sort of being a destination place such as Shoreditch and where is our 15 minute neighborhood strategy linked to our economic regeneration strategy because one should one should be driving uh, the other to a greater or lesser extent which helps us to maintain local economies and also um, help with more active and uh, decarbonized travel um, would, can we ask sorry um, is there uh, Suzanne, is that all right? I wanted to also just bring in a couple of other things. There's a couple of other observations before you go. Of course. Councillor Potter. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for your presentation, Suzanne. Um, rightly so, we are looking at you know the borough-wide um, economic recovery plan currently. But I wonder whether within this you're have you've got scope to kind of look. And I know this is going to be part of our work program later on in in the year, but how we support um, small and medium-sized biz businesses to decarbonize, de but also to um, support those local businesses that may be providing our kind of green tech in the years to come, such as heat, heat pump installers, for instance. So I just wondered whether that the, you know, you have the capacity to do some thinking along those lines currently. Suzanne? Yes, I think that um, in terms of my final slides, when I talked about our kind of future um, kind of economic recovery plan, town centre plan, I mean, certainly to, to answer your first question, Chair, the 15 minute city or 15 minute neighbourhood, sorry, is a, is a key part of that. So in terms of all this thinking that we're doing on our town centres, that is kind of really key to, to what our future strategy, because we know that working in a lot of a lot of our happy centres working really well and it is cutting kind of transport emissions etc so that that's definitely part of it and i think um, i think andrew's going to talk a bit more on the kind of green jobs um which is a big focus of recovery um but that's certainly going to feature in the strategy as well um and and kind of we really want to figure out you know what does a good green job look like how do we kind of capture what we've already what we're already doing well there in Hackney, what are the current opportunities and how do we kind of maximise those um, and, and kind of build on those to to kind of really encourage businesses to be greener in their practices, but also kind of to deliver these 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 green jobs as well. Great. Councillor Stops has got a question. Yeah, do do we have a 15 minute strategy? Where did that come from? We've already been talking quite a lot about 15 minute neighbourhoods, I think, in the transport strategy when I've been discussing with Councillor Coburn. Does the council have a 15 minute strategy? I don't know, Councillor Stops. Shall I explore that? <laughs> first um, perhaps we can find that out from other officers that are distinct from the ones in front of us, but Suzanne, you might be able to help. Yeah, I, I think I think in terms of the 15 minute kind of city concept, I think probably where it sits for the council is within the, the, the kind of document that I mentioned that we'll, that we'll be bringing forward later this year. Um, so um, I may I may be missing something that that other colleagues might have already done, um, but I think that from my perspective, in terms of thinking about it as a kind of economic um, kind of tool um, or an economic approach, that's certainly kind of the the document that I'm that I'm proposing that we really focus um, or, on that kind of new approach. Um, and and like I say, I think to be honest, I think a lot of it is already happening in Hackney anyway. Um, and I think we just need to kind of look at what other opportunities there are and, and, and be able to build upon those and obviously link across to our um, kind of other strategies or focus on kind of climate change um, and, and net zero and just make sure that it's fully linked up with all the other opportunities and all the other kind of ambitions that the council has. 
Thank you very much, Dan. I'm sorry to press you when you're running over all the time that you've um, committed to us, but I'd, I've got one question from Councillor Pallas before you go. I'll, I'll be very quick and thank you so much, Suzanne, for your uh, presentation and um, for, for your answers. Um, it's just about coming out of COVID, whether you think we need to see potentially an expansion of Article 4 um, kind of directives, particularly around preventing, you know, um, units which were, you know, focused on retail, going to kind of residential. So I, I know there's quite a lot in place. I know there's, um, I know my own ward in Old Hill Street, um, there's one in the place, but it'd just be good to get your your, your views on that. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, no, no, that's a really important issue. I mean, I think as a council, we're really good on Article 4, so you've picked up on ones that we've already got in place. Um, so as far as I know, I think we're, um, I, from my perspective, we're, we're well covered um, in terms of retail uses kind of going to going to other um kind of non non-retail uses um so i feel feel fairly confident on that one i think probably what's worth kind of mentioning and again i think probably one for the the next kind of town center session is is the change to the planning use classes um so you'll be aware that the the kind of traditional use classes of kind of a b c and d um and what what can change within those has really been recently changed by the government to allow a lot more flexibility within use classes. Um, and I think actually for town centres and given what's happened, I think some of that could be quite positive. Um, but again, as I mentioned, in terms of kind of the team's work with strategic planning um, and the impact that that is going to have, that's something that we're currently kind of thinking about. Um, and, and I think that's something that we could we could talk about further. Um, but in terms of Article Fours at the moment, I feel like we are we are we are well covered, um, and the risk is pretty low given given the, the Article Fours we have in place. Thank you very uh, much, Suzanne. Um, any any further questions? I, I'm just uh, highly aware of time. We've already stretched um, Suzanne's time quite a lot, but I think we're, we're extremely grateful to you for providing us with uh, such a sort of comprehensive and wide-ranging um, presentation on where we think we are and has obviously raised some questions about what we think we need to know both as an administration and as um, a scrutiny commission on some of those knowledge gaps but it will be we'd be very grateful to have some of that data that was specifically asked for by councillors um, in order to inform our work plan going forward that's really what this session is about Thank you so much. Can we move on to Andrew and the skills agenda, please, Andrew? Yes. Hello. Thank you, Chair. Um, for those of you who I don't know, I'm Andrew Monk, Head of Employment Skills and Adult Learning. Um, I'm going to talk primarily about um, adult learning and skills today in response to uh -huh. the um, specific asks of the Commission. Um, I'm going to talk to quite a lot of data. I don't have a presentation, but most of it comes from existing evidence bases. Um, the council has. Um, sorry, let me, give me one sec to find the document. So the, the particular areas um, discussed were the current skills landscape, um, the skills demanded by the labour market, um, green economy and green skills, and the sort of adult learning delivery model we were focused on accessibility and inequality. So I'm going to talk to those in turn. So beginning with the skills landscape, um, so, so over the last 10 years, Hackney's experienced uh, a, quite a significant increase in the proportion of residents with higher qualifications and, and likewise a decrease in the proportion of residents with, with no qualifications. Um, so we've seen an increase in the number of residents with, with level one, level two and level three. Um, but it's worth saying that, that in spite of this changing, we, we still have 19% of working age residents, so that's about 40,000 people still with even no formal qualifications or um, higher qualifications uh, is level one. Um, so kind of um, another way of putting that is we've got 20% of people who, who don't have GCSE um, English and maths. Um, so that's kind of worth noting alongside when we think about kind of um, that increase in higher level qualifications. Um, and I guess sort of zooming out a bit from the Hackney specific thing, what we've been noticing in London um, sort of pre-COVID um, is that we have seen the emergence of this hourglass economy. So 
um, a rise in a number of jobs which are kind of level two and below and a significant rise in jobs which require level four and above. Um, it's called an hourglass because you, you have that bit of a middle which is sort of disappearing. So people who have that mid-level skill um, are, are in some difficulties, were before COVID and, and are, are on more so now. And so there is a need to enable people to, to progress through that ladder to higher <coughs> skills. Um, so that's a key focus for us. Um, just a few pertinent kind of pound London trends as well, which were also kind of active before COVID. Um, a, a London Adult Community Learning Review um, from a couple of years ago identified that young people and care leavers in particular were, were missing out on a number of adult learning and training and job opportunities. And also um, there is a real challenge with um, people's retraining and switching sectors, which we'll talk a bit about in the green economy section. Um, moving on to the general skills demanded by the labour market, um, there's been, um, a bit like Suzanne's area, a number of very good reports um, around this, pre-COVID and post-COVID. Um, a local government association report um, looked at um, a balance, the, the, the need for a balanced approach between kind of both technical skills and qualifications, as well as more transferable skills, sometimes called soft skills, but I'd, I'd prefer to call it transferable skills, such as good communication skills, critical thinking, and problem solving. So, so I think this is an interesting thing to think about, that combination of sort of sector-specific vocational skills with those more um, generic skills. Um, to put it another way, City of London has done a lot of work on this with employers and they, they did some important work with Nesta, who are a think tank, who used the phrase um, of fusion skills um, to think about these transferable skills around different contexts, um, which blend skills, knowledge, behaviours, attitude, and, and the thinking being from businesses that this is what will be particularly important in the 21st century. Um, Alongside this, there are a number of sector-specific skills which are required, um, and sort of, sort of building on some of the things Suzanne was talking about, there are obviously a number of sectors which are struggling and are likely to continue to struggle, such as retail and hospitality. But there are a number of other sectors which have actually grown um, during COVID-19 and are likely to continue to grow, particularly the health and care sector, um, IT and digital, and I'm going to talk a bit about the green economy in a minute. And so an important focus for ourselves as a council in terms of adult education and with partners is to focus on the skills needs of these sectors and pathway, pathways into job. Um, but it's important to, to recognise that a lot of these sectors, for example, health and social care, don't just require specific skills in, for example, nursing or social care qualifications, but also more generic skills such as administration, finance and IT. And the same is true of IT. Um, the majority of jobs in IT aren't actually, um, you know, requiring coding and kind of high level digital skills, but often more generic skills, which is touching on that point about um, sort of fusion skills I made earlier. Um, in terms of green skills and jobs, which is a particular interest I know of the Commission, um, we are at, I would say, some of the beginning of our thinking as a service area around this. And what's interesting is that there's a huge demand from partners for the council to take a lead on this and, and I'll touch a bit later on kind of the importance of partnership working within the skills system. Um, but obviously we are very aware that both at a GLA level, a Mayor of London level and, and the council level, there is huge investment in terms of um, building a more green economy. Um, so just to look at the GLA's um, and the Mayor of London's Green New Deal programme with that focus on decarbonisation, um, including through solar installation, with a focus on green transport, public realm, um, including tackling transport emissions through electric vehicles and charging points. And there's also a focus on green foundations, so supporting businesses in the green economy. Each of those is going to create a significant number of jobs. And a key focus of adult learning over the next couple of years will be to really understand the qualifications and skills required by these areas and um, make sure that we are providing the right skills, make sure we're influencing partners such as the GLA, but it's actually possible to fund these training qualifications and also making sure there's pathways and ring fence jobs for those areas. Um, more locally, um, we are working increasingly closely with the relevant parts of the council to understand um, particular, particular areas where there are going to be jobs locally 
um, through the council's interventions, including through our own energy company, including through um, greening our own homes, um, including things such as putting um, solar panels on buildings and, and, and doing things such as tree, tree planting programs. And, and one of the points of, about the adult learning sitting more corporately is it better enables those conversations. So again, making sure we're providing the right skills and that there are those pathways into jobs in the same way that we do with um, in areas such as adult social care and making sure that there are those pathways there. Um, the last area I want to talk a bit about um, in terms of um, is, the, is, I guess, the adult learning delivery model. Um, during the pandemic, and very early on in the pandemic, the, the, the team moved very quickly to, to get the um, service delivery online. That was a very new thing. It wasn't something which had done before. Um, adult learning is delivered through a mix of both partners who we commission and doing an in-house delivery. And, and by um, June last, um, from at the start of the pandemic to so June 2020, um, 50, more than 50% of courses were being delivered online. Um, which was very successful. And then this was built upon further um, from September um, 2020. Um, the other thing which happened in the pandemic was all courses were, information about all courses were put online, which was an entirely new thing for the adult learning service. Um, and there was a very um, significant move towards more of an outcomes focused delivery. So um, rather than quite a traditional focus on adult learning on, on outputs and how many learners getting through, there has been this shift both by the GLA and very much in Hackney towards an outcome focus, how many people are moving into employment, how many are progressing to, to um, higher learning um, and also a number of social outcomes. And as we plan for next year's commissioning, um, there will be a very explicit focus on three key areas for adult learning. Um, training with a direct link to employment opportunities. Um, secondly, building functional and transferable skills. And thirdly, supporting our residents' well-being and positive mental health. Um, the last thing I want to touch on is just accessibility um, and points about equalities groups. Um, we are very aware that digital exclusion um, remains a significant issue and, and has since um, the start of the pandemic. So whilst, yes, courses were moved online because it was a necessity, the team um, has focused strongly on trying to mitigate um, the impact of digital exclusion. Um, this, is, this includes things such as thinking very carefully about how accessible the online um, delivery is, um, making sure there are things, programs such as digital buddies to support people who need the extra help to access online delivery, um, and also rolling out a program of devices for those who need it. Um, so far, we've delivered, uh, rolled out over 200 devices. Um, and as we go forward, we are thinking how we can work with a number of community partners, um, libraries, children's centres to provide that more holistic um, offer around addressing digital exclusion. And in terms of inequality, just to, I guess if you stats for you, um, we currently have a service um, in terms of learners, 75% um, of learners are women. Um, this is um, kind of symptomatic of some of the, the history of the service area, which a lot of delivery from children's centres. Um, we know there needs to be more of a focus on aiming for more of a 50-50 in terms of men and women. And we're thinking carefully in terms of where we deliver the service from to enable that. There is good um, spread and representation in terms of minority ethnic groups accessing the service. 43% um, of learners describe themselves as black or black British. Um, and in terms of health conditions, the service is doing well at reaching um, residents who have health conditions with 40% of learners identifying as having some sort of learning difficulty, disability or health issue. Um, of course, there's always more work to do in this area, but it's certainly very much within the DNA of the service. Um, I'm going to stop there. Um, happy to take questions um, and also happy to discuss kind of areas which Commission may like you to come back in, in terms of wider employment and skills offer. Thank you very much, Andrew. That's really helpful. Um, I'll open up this for questions and uh, contributions from the Commission. Who would like to start? Councillor Potter. Thank you.
how to support the green economy and find out the skills and qualifications that are needed. I know we, we are going to explore that further. I was also pleased to hear about your work on supporting people dig digitally, but obviously 200 um, laptops, which you mentioned, is a very small fraction, and obviously it's very concerning about the huge numbers that aren't engaging in that way, and I look forward to hearing some more detail about that. Um, my other, my question is to find out more about what you talked about, the hour, hourglass effect. It's quite concerning that these um, middle-tier jobs are going. I'm particularly concerned about where the level ones and twos can go to. You know, it's quite a big gap to jump from level one and two to level four. And in terms of um, increasing equality in our society, it's really important that we have the means for uh, people to progress at a rate that's appropriate to them to kind of fully engage. So could you talk a little bit about the reasons for that and any work that the council can do to kind of support um, progression for level um, level ones and level twos? Thank you. Yep, yeah, certainly. So yeah, the hourglass economy um, is a very challenging, I guess, sort of macroeconomic trend um which we can't really do a lot about that trend but we can do in terms of how we might mitigate it one of the main things i would say is um we are focusing more and more on thinking about um the adult skills system in the borough as a whole so rather than thinking about adult education just in terms of what we as a council deliver thinking about what our partners such as new city college deliver who deliver far more provision than we do as a council in terms of our funded provision and other community partners and thinking how it all fits together. So as an example, um, New City College are probably better placed to deliver level three um, courses and the GLA has freed up some of that provision. It used to be that all um, adult education budget provision was level two and below and they are, GLA is focusing more on level three, um, which is something Mary Glanville has also been lobbying them on along with their principal of New City College. So that is, I'd say, a key pathway, um, more level three courses. But I guess the challenge we have here as a service is if you do more of that, we also know that, as I was mentioning in my presentation, we have 20% of people in the borough who have the level two and below qualifications. So there's a real challenge here. Um, I would say that um, private providers who are delivering on a number of government programs, um, noticeably work and health program, and restart are engaging more and more with skills vision and pathways and investing in skills and pathways to jobs. And again, that's something which we and I spend a lot of our time doing, talking and influencing those providers so that they are also investing in this skills landscape. Thank you, Andrew. We have Councillor Palace. Yeah, thank you very much, um, Andrew. Um, I think in the previous session, um, talked about equalities um, and um, two groups which I think were particularly kind of un underrepresented um, were I believe the, the Turkish community and also the, the Haredi um, community. Um, I understand um, that there has been a contract I believe with Vista Training to undertake work 2020 to 2021 with the Haredi community but I was just wondering if you could kind of break down um, the, the data for kind of BME community, it's a very broad term and a lot of people within those communities don't necessarily abide by that term, but if, if you could say a bit more about um, what engagement has been like from those communities very broadly defined during 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 the kind of lockdown period, have we seen, um, you know, uh, a decrease, increase in engagement, what the barriers been? Um, and, and just to very, um, to going forward, um, I'm very interested about how the council work, particularly with the Haredi community, around our apprenticeship scheme, um, and about potentially working with uh, Haredi businesses um, to develop um, particular uh, placements, and whether any thought has gone into that, and, and, and what that potentially can look like, alongside other groups um, that potentially underrepresented in our, our schemes. Thank you. Thank you uh, thanks, thanks Councillor Paz. Can I add to that slightly, Andrew, that I think there's there's quite a lot of data that we could really do with presented more formally 
um, particularly when it comes to this kind of analysis and breakdown of the work, working age population, as well as the actual workforce of the council, things to do with BME, breakdown of apprenticeships, accessibility and so forth, which which can and should be presented in, in a format that is, is digestible for us, I think, so that we can understand better what questions we need to ask you about the actions that you're taking and whether we think that they're satisfactory. So we'd really like that in that data analysis presented to us more formally in the future, if that's possible. That, that's fine and noted. And um, the team um, does produce quarterly um, reports on things like apprenticeship programmes and work placements. And um, Council Williams um, often does um, drop-in sessions um, for uh, members, but but certainly but all these reports exist and, and um, Chair and Tim, you know, happy to um, provide these. Just on council policies, um, points about Haredi community. So um, as you say, council policies, we have um, previously commissioned specific courses, including VISTA, um, to deliver within the community. Um, I can't comment right now what's going to be delivered next year because it's currently out for procurement. Um, so I'm not able to do that, but it's certainly something which we continue to work closely with partners from the community in terms of dialogue and shaping what courses we should deliver and very much encourage um, them to bid to then deliver it. And, and I guess the model is very much working with um, at least eight or ten different providers to deliver. It, it, it's interesting, often the GLA will say to us, can you work with a smaller number of providers, it makes life easier for funders and actually for ourselves. And we often push back to make the point which Council Palace is making to say, yes, but we would lose that community reach. Um, I'm going to need to get back to you on the, your question about um, the Turkish community because I don't have that information to hand. Um, I would also say in terms of your question about um, the Haredi community, I know that there was a question, and Tim, I don't know if you can look at this Council Palace previously, um, submitted about the Haredi community and access to adult learning and um, also about apprenticeship programs and work placements which I know Council Williams um, responded to and um, so I wouldn't want to repeat that same information but um, if we could have a, have a look at that. It may well be Andrew that we need that information updated since uh, I think okay. it, was some, it was some months ago since since Council Palace asked that question and there may well be changes and if, but if it ha if it isn't and it's the same we just need to know that's all that, any that, further that's yeah. it, any further questions from the commission I, um, I'm aware uh, councillor Sharman yeah I've got a, a slightly wider question just building on the point you made chair about the need for some information uh, I think I, I would certainly just coming back to Stephen's initial presentation like to see uh, the basic business plan with the allocation of investment by those streams of activity. Because only in that way, I think, we can get a sense of the priorities between these various competing uh, bits of work and, and also match that against the targets that we're hoping to achieve uh, with that investment. Uh, and, and as you've said, in a digestible form, uh, you know, um, quite a simple so a couple of spreadsheet things that simply says this is the money going into it this is what we're hoping to achieve and these are the key streams of activity and i think that really comes to the point of of this commission one of its jobs it seems to me is to oversee the regeneration function and, and i think that's a key part of ensuring that so i guess it's a question both to andrew and to stephen for for whether they can produce uh, something like that for our next meeting. Thanks very much. I'll take Stephen since he's, he's raised his hand in the room. Stephen. Uh, we will provide the commission with whatever you want. Um, if you're up, very clear about that. In whatever format you want. <clears throat> to enable us to do that, we need to be clear about that um, in advance. And perhaps there's something um, that, that Andrew, myself, Suzanne, will do with Tim uh, before meetings in terms of prepping, making sure that we've got the information right for you. Um, so, yeah, just, yeah, absolutely. We will give you what you need. Yeah, I think it's. It, I, th I felt that we were quite clear that we wanted some real analysis of the skills gaps and so forth, and we'd like that in in data form. And as Councillor Sharman points out, investment and outcomes from that investment, because we need to know where where we're really getting good bang for our buck, and what and ha what are the metrics, what constitutes success. We know because it's an award-winning apprenticeship scheme that we win awards with our apprenticeship scheme. What are the other benefits, not only to the 
and to the individuals who uh, secure those apprenticeships, but um, beyond that, and how do we measure that effectiveness? But also going back to this wider issue of coming out of the economic crisis of the of, of COVID with some real skills squeezes, which we've heard about, some potential um, demand for uh, more more skills, which we may not have, and where and how that those skills are going to be provided by the private sector or by the public sector, where the where the council is going to commission those, how the council creates a skilled workforce by the way that it deploys its own procurement uh, capacity. Those are the kind of questions we really want to understand if we're talking about scrutinising the, the council's role in rebuilding um, Hackney's economy to be you know, greener and better in the future. Um, sorry, I feel like I've abused my position as chair um, one too many times. Any further questions from the commission? Can I just do a quick follow-up? Absolutely, yes, do, yes. do that. Uh, it's, it's, just, it's just to clarify something that um, Andrew said. I, I was in correspondence with um, Councillor Williams, um, particularly in reference to the Haredi community and about you know, how we can go forward and build upon what we're doing. I think it would be great potentially if we could do a formal letter maybe through the committee um, about this, um, maybe to, to Andrew, just so it's in, in, in the system um, and just so we can make sure it um, can be, be tracked. I understand that this is a big area um, in, in terms of the equalities piece, you know, looking across the board about group set aren't necessarily um, always represented in everything you know we're, we're, we're doing and trying to break down barriers. Um, but could I, could I request that a, a letter or, or a recommendation could, could come out of, of this meeting to, to Andrew, Councillor uh, Billington? Yes, certainly. And just to come in, sir, if yeah. I may, sorry, just in terms of how we report data, very much in line with kind of Council's corporate approach um, to um, equality is, is we, we very much have moved away from the sort of BAME label and very much focused down in individual uh, minority ethnic groups which on a kind of the, the dashboards we provide so we absolutely have the data to hand Council Palace and Chair. Great I'm glad we've got the data on that I will reiterate that we're keen to see the data on the skills gaps and the, um, the wider um, analysis that we require in terms of rebuilding the economy. Councillor Stops Sorry, are we going back to ask Stephen some questions? If you would like to, yes, you're absolutely open to do that, yeah. Well, one particular one. And that, part of your function is housing regeneration, isn't it? Uh, it is now. So, okay. <laughs> I'm not sure where, which area you... So, Chris Trowell's sort of area. So, Chris reports up to me, yeah. Okay. Um, can you tell me um, why we don't see in this borough any housing, any public housing money? You know, in the good old days, we used to get housing associations would come forward with grants. Then Boris turned up and sort of that, you know, was basically poor. But we don't seem to have had any um, uh, GLA funded housing grant um, for housing in this borough. It's all down to the council doing its bit. Um, it's a very good question, Council Stops. We do, in fact, have GLA funded schemes. And we're currently going through a, um, a funding bid at the moment with GLA, um, but it, it's one of the very it's one of the very few that there are. So, in terms of the funding we receive from external sources, you're absolutely right. There's very little. Hence, the fact that our delivery model is based on the cross subsidised. But are we, are we missing out? Does Islington get this stuff and Tower Hamlets? Where, where's it going? No, no, I don't think we're missing out. Um, but I think in terms of uh, again the remit of the commission. Um, and exploring, as Catherine Sharm was saying, regeneration more widely. We'd be very happy to come back and share the funding streams with you um, and show you how we're financing our delivery. Um, but, you know, I don't want to sit here and say we, we don't get very much money, but we don't get very much money. Uh, so that's why we've taken the approach we have around direct delivery. I can't remember the last housing grant scheme that came before the committee. And um, you know, where, where's it? If there is any, I know it's going to support various things, but um, it seems strange that we don't get any. The second, can I make just one point to go back into this this 50 minute city, my life. Um, my, in my ward is is Wilton Way. Mm. Uh, Wilton Way was was um, 
regenerated by the council's regeneration department um, a number of years ago. And I just think that, you know, we can teach lots of people about 15 minute cities. I, I don't quite understand why we're, you know, if we are directing officers to go away and think about 15 minute cities. Um, because I, I think that, you know, Hackney is, is brimming with local activity and you can, you can go and do your shopping, your, all manner of stuff within 15 minutes. So why are we going down this direction of trouble? Um, Chair, shall I respond? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think from my point of view, the concept of 15 minute cities or 15 minute neighbourhoods is one of a number of sort of um, ideas that are being explored across the world in terms of how we create little neighbourhoods, whatever it might be. I think there are some critiques of 15 minute neighbourhoods. I think there's the risk of displacement and gentrification that I think we probably so there's no direction travel kind of stops in terms of us becoming a 15 minute city, but it's one of a many, it's one of many ideas that we need to be thinking about as we move forward with area regeneration, housing delivery, all these sorts of things. And going back right to the beginning of the meeting and my very brief presentation, the reason that the services have come together under me, housing delivery, area regeneration, employment skills, learning, et cetera, et cetera, is to have this wider sense of how we're trying to shape place, working very closely with planning and this sort of stuff. So. Um, I don't think it's a, a direction of travel. I think it's one of many things that we need to be thinking about as we move forward, particularly in a sort of post-COVID world where people are working um, from home a lot and staying within neighbourhoods. But the point around recognising the critiques out there and making sure that we're thinking about that holistically is really important too. So, um, yeah, I, I think I hope that sort of answers the question. Yeah, if I could just carry on a bit. I mean, Partly why I asked the question early, you know, we've always concentrated on Hackney Central, Dalston, Hackney Wick, and Shoreditch, you know, and if we are to do things about 15 bit, you know, it is the, the Hoxtons and the, the Stoke Newington um, High Street and the, the, the various, you know, town centres, I think it, it is legitimate and, you know, to keep reminding ourselves that it's not all about Shoreditch, Hackney Central and Dalston. Um, but, but I think that, that that's the, I guess, the local spin on the 15 minute thing. Yeah. Thank you very much for letting me say that. And just, and just very quickly, Chair, I'm, I'm abusing my position now a bit, but um, alongside the area regeneration approach, what I'm really keen that we do is explore more localised sort of place-based interventions on estates and local areas. And, and it, it's, it's melding those different approaches is what I'm interested in. But to be honest, my priority is those residents and communities that need our help the most. Um, so when it comes to sort of delivering outcomes, that's what, our, that's what my focus is on. Um, but yes, we could probably have this, con this conversation in my community, but I'm ready to move on. Can I follow up a little bit? Because I, strictly speaking, we don't have housing as part of our remit, but you have yeah. the new homes as part of your um, uh, um, sort of empire, as it were, but we are aware that the power of the local of the local council in planning and building our own homes is a specific opportunity for economic growth, and you have a gr great chance to make some big decisions about the nature of that economic growth, the creation of a workforce, um, developing skills, and so forth. So I'm wondering whether. In that context, we might think, ask you just to flag now that we will be interested in understanding what you are doing about decarbonizing regeneration in terms of that skills and workforce. What does, and, and when we have our skills inquiry in November, where you see the skills gap in order to be able to create those low carbon homes that you should be building, for example. And what is it about the way that you are designing that? housing strategy that enables us to be able to do that right and with with a, a good well-skilled local workforce i'd welcome that chair i've had discussions on the email today about decarbonization of our future delivery of housing and um, all the things you've mentioned the things that we're thinking about the timing is really good because we're looking at strategy and approach around new homes delivery so yeah um i would really really uh, welcome that again I think it's important that we are clear, you know, clear in advance of the meetings about how best we can support your work. So, um, again, going to the data point, if there's a way that perhaps you and I could have some discussions beforehand as well uh, with Tim, that would be really, really helpful. Great. 
Are there any further questions for either Andrew or Steve? Councillor Spence. Thank you, Jay. I wanted to go back to Andrew's presentation and the, um, it sounded to me like a remarkable figure, which is 20% of the working age um, population in Hackney um, don't have either English or maths at GCSE le level. And within that, I imagine we're, we're talking about also a level of some functional illiteracy and yeah. numeracy. Um, I'd like to see some more figures about that, that, that um, 40,000 uh, number. Uh, and I'd also like to know what our strategy is to address that through the resources that we've got through council and uh, through our partners in Hackney, including uh, New City College and, and so on. I'm sure there is a strategy, but um, I'd like to, to know a bit more about that at some point. Thank you. I think that's a, it's a, it's an extremely important point, and it is quite a, a jaw-dropping. It is actually much higher than the national average, is it not, Andrew? That is correct, yeah. How much higher? Um, I'll need to go and find out how much higher, but yeah, it is higher. Um, and I mean, in response, if I may, to kind of the focus, hence, this is why that focus um, and decision uh, by the Mayor and Council Williams around that, that three-pronged approach of kind of skilling people up for um, jobs in the labour market. And secondly, that one about functional skills, and thirdly, the one about um, well-being, <coughs> Um, community learning and well-being. A second one about functional skills is and will remain so important because it, it provides that that bedrock, that foundation for, for, for any other job, having that basic levels of, of maths and English functional skills. And the point about partnership working, um, one of the, the opportunities the pandemic has afforded is closer working with key local anchor institutions such as New City College and, J and Job Centre Plus. Um, I don't remember ever working nearly as closely with them before the pandemic as we do now. And it is, again, very much focusing on those shared strategic challenges such as this one and making sure that our um, curriculums dovetail with one another um, and that we are spreading our shared resources as closely as possible because we're never going to be able to tackle that challenge simply by the amount of resource we get in our education budget from the GLA alone. That's helpful. But again, it does go back to investment and outcomes because um, actually not a lot of investment can go in with actually quite some profound outcomes for individuals and for the wider local economy. And it can quite often be the kind of false economy that uh, Conservative governments choose to make, which is to cut basic skills education. And we will need to be speaking up for it, I think, um, as an administration and as a council. Do we have any further questions for Stephen and Andrew, before I move on to the next item on the agenda. We have Councillor Smith and Councillor Pallas. I'm sorry, that's because I've not been paying attention to my screen. Councillor Smith and then Councillor Pallas. Um, You're on mute, Councillor Smith. Thank you. Just uh, coming back to my original question um, about the kind of connection between social infrastructure and economic infrastructure. I mean, obviously, we're talking a lot about economic stuff here, but um, I want to know um, any thoughts from Stephen in regards to what more we can do to support and strengthen childcare, um, health, work support and mental health services and trying to sort of connect them up to the sort of economic um, infrastructure agenda. So basically sort of tying in social resources that enable people to participate meaningfully in society and the economy and also the kind of economic side. And then the final question, um, your thoughts on the importance of bringing citizens and experts together to make decisions about the future of our economy here in Hackney, um, to ensure that the citizens' values are directly, sh you know, directly shape the sort of clean growth that we want to pursue. Because um, you want, I think in one of your uh, slides, you, you mentioned engaging in, in democratic in democratic processes with the community to try and sort of formulate some kind of future. I mean, do you feel that we, we, we you know, we could have a, a kind of citizens more participation from citizens, basically, on trying to work our way forward? Thank you. Stephen. Thanks, Councillor Smith. Uh, the last one first. We should be engaging as many people as we can um, if, in, in as many sectors as we can in terms of how we deliver our, our outcomes. Um, we have traditional methods of doing that. We need to develop those um, and become, I think, the parlance is more agile in how we do this stuff. Um, but for me, there's something about ensuring that we speak to people outside the 
more traditional networks. I think groups, individuals who have voice that are often prevented from accessing, you know, our, our discourse through barriers that exist. Um, so that's a sort of long winner way of saying uh, yes, um, absolutely. Um, well, just to just to point out that on our work plan, we've got something specifically about community involvement and regeneration. So we will be asking you further questions on that. Okay. What's worked and what hasn't? Give me the same that I was about to say, and I saw in your work plan earlier that you have an item going forward on that. So we'll be happy to come back in there. Um, and it actually, just on that, it'd be useful if we engage Sonia uh, to in that discussion as well from a wider perspective. In terms of your uh, question on social infrastructure, I'll probably ask Andrew to come in as well, as uh, Councillor Smith. Um, it's really important that we marry the two, um, uh, the social uh, infrastructure to economic output. Um, there is lots of discussion happening across the organisation at the moment, again, accelerated by COVID and what's been happening. Um, by myself, public health, children and young people, adult services. Um, we are always engaging government, um, or trying to engage government on, uh, on how we support um, working parents, parents more generally, single parents, who it might be, in terms of um, their ability to access employment opportunity skills um, and wider economic um, sort of flows. But Andrew's team does a lot of work on this. And Andrew, very briefly, is there anything you want to add to that? Not only that, um, yes, there is sort of increasing amounts of work recognising that sort of where people face barriers to um, adult education or barriers to employment, they are also likely to, um, I guess, have high levels of deprivation in terms of access to social infrastructure, particularly health, and hence the need for that networked opportunity. And there is a lot of joint work between ourselves and health, both in terms of um, providing support for people with disabilities but also um, areas increasingly such as people in rehabilitation and I think we're doing more and more work with adult education with teams such as community halls and libraries on exactly the point you mentioned Gilbert but, but perhaps it's a topic for a, um, a future commission thinking about that social infrastructure in the round and that hyper local approach Stephen also mentioned previously. We actually explored when we were discussing the work plan whether we should do something specifically about the economic impact of the, the economic role of care because actually without without caring mostly gets done for free and yet without it the economy would fall over and as ever most most economies are dependent on uh, on that uh, unpaid burden so we wanted to explore that and actually the economic value of the social infrastructure that therefore frees people up to be able to, do, to be more economically productive is something that we were considering exploring we've decided not to do that in, in the current work plan but we are it is worthwhile Minute, you know, noting that there is an, an interest and appetite amongst um, members of the Commission to explore that further at some future date. Um, and if you have that kind of economic analysis, we'd be very interested in seeing it because, again, it's a good way of understanding how we can rebuild the economy and, and what that value is that it contributes. Um, Councillor Pallas. Yeah, I'll, I'll be very quick. It's, it's for Stephen. Um, it's about um, our workforce and affordability. Obviously, one of the major pulls upon our workforce in Hackney is housing. I know it doesn't exactly fall in the remit of this committee, but I'm just um, building up what Councillor Billington is saying. And, um, and do we really think that um, products such as shared ownership are really genuinely kind of affordable? For, for our workforce in, in Hackney when, you know, they, they cripple many with with enormous amount of debt, which they are unlikely to um, pay off. And and secondly, do we think in, in, there are alternative um, tenure models for housing regenerations going forward, which don't include shared ownership? And will the council be considering this kind of going forward? Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Pallas. As I've sort of alluded to, this, this is a very timely moment, really, because I think um, working with, uh, obviously, Mayor and Cabinet and, and Council more widely, we'll be looking at our approach and strategy to new homes delivery over the next six to nine months in the run-up um, to next year. Um, is shared ownership affordable? I mean, it, that's, again, we could have that discussion for two, three hours here. Um, might, if I could, I'd build every home in this borough of social rent mm. for £650 million, pounds, um, and we need to find that from somewhere. So we've taken an approach to date that has included shared ownership as a tenure myth. 
which others have done as well, to ensure that we can deliver um, as much um, genuinely affordable um, product as we can. It's as much a political question as it is an organisational question around shared ownership. Um, but uh, I suppose the macro answer, Council of Palace, is uh, yes, we are going to be exploring options and models. Um, and again, I don't want to sound like a broken record, but it's something that we really. Um, Councillors will know better than I can stop when I break now to the program. Um, Councillors will know better than I can stop when I break now. Uh, we started our model probably 10, 12 years ago, um, and things have changed uh, you know, very dramatically in that period, not least in the last year. So, um, yes, and we will be very happy to talk to you more about that approach moving forward. Thank you very much, Stephen. Thank you, Andrew. And obviously, previously, thank you very much to Suzanne. I'm going to wrap up that item of the, the agenda because we're, uh, we're managing to just about stick to time and move to item eight, which is minutes of the previous meeting. Can we um, approve those as a true record of that last meeting, those of us who were in attendance? Agreed. Agreed. Great. And do we have any other business before we close the meeting? Anything that people want to raise? In relation to anything at all apologies for not reading the remit of the committee that's all right <laughs> um councillor stops these things happen um and we will keep try to keep as much as uh, as we can to that remit but we also know that um we have we have an appetite to know so much about what's going on because this is an important part of uh uh, what the what the council does thank you again to everybody for this evening's meeting i declare this meeting now closed thank you everyone